And as I got there, I went to get down to my stomach. And as I put my right knee on the floor, uh, that was the moment that I, I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. If this thing had gone directly upwards, then there would be nothing of me left, just a pink cloud. But I think because we're in this shallow bowl, it must have been at some sort of an angle. And as I've gone down, it's maybe it gone at a 45 degree, which is why it took my right arm off, left my, I got a little bit of shrapnel damage on my palm, but my left hand is fine. And it took both my legs off. And as and I pulled my arm out, I looked at it and I kind of giggled a bit. And the nurse was like, what are you laughing at, Mark? I said, I'm hallucinating again. Looks like my arm's falling off. And she just looked at me like, and I was like, okay, I think I get it now. We're on day seven. It's both legs above the knee, right arm above the elbow. And all I've got is my ass muscles. I've got some hamstrings and quads that don't work, a bit of lower back and some core. And that's how I have to drive my prosthetics to walk. Mm. So it takes three to 500% more energy for me to do anything than an able-bodied person. You never think this might sound a little bit harsh, right? And, and people might not like what I'm going to say now, but you got to take a bit of personal responsibility, right? You can't expect anybody to come swooping in to save the day for you. That's just not how it works, right? And this is the thing that I advocate more than anything. Physical fitness is the cure to 99% of people's problems, particularly, you know, mental health problems. Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Today we're talking men's mental health and resilience with Mark Ormrod. Mark is a former Royal Marine Commando, is an Invictus Games athlete, an author, motivational speaker, and MBE. Mark, welcome, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's a cool introduction, man. Thank you very much. Yeah, was that all right? That was pretty good, yeah. I think yeah. that's the best one he's done. It is. He, fu he fucks him up every time. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Honestly, mate. Yeah. Really? Normally, it's about like three goes yeah. or it's just waffle. Oh, okay. So, so it was uh, a good one. It was one of the best I've had. Thanks, thanks mate. So, thank you. <laughs> thanks. You're welcome. Well, thanks for coming on, mate. Really appreciate it. Um, and I think we, we talked obviously offline a second ago, but I think most people that know your name mm -hmm. are going to know your story. Okay. Um, so we don't want to make this a podcast about that particular incident um, because you've obviously written a book about that, mm -hmm. Man Down. Mm -hmm. So people can check that out. Uh, you've obviously talked about it on a number of occasions. Uh, what we really want to talk about is our overarching focus, which is men's mental health. Okay. And I think with everything that you've been through and everything you've achieved since that, um, I think you might have a few insights in regards to how to manage mindset mm -hmm. um, and over overcome adversity and and stay positive and stay strong. Yep. So I think it might be a really good opportunity to try and unpick the state of men's mental health uh, and go through that sort of stuff. Um, that said, I think there will be people watching that won't know your story. Okay. And it is a fucking insane story. Um, so it will be great to cover it. Um, but what we're going to do in the timeline is we're going to put in a, a, a trapter so that if people are watching and they are familiar and they want to just jump forward to the more recent stuff you've done yeah. and the men's mental health stuff, they can do that. Cool. Um, otherwise, people can obviously listen to the story. Right. Is that all right? Yeah. So if you've heard this boring story before, just fast forward to the uh, <laughs> recent stuff. So, uh, so if you'd be so kind, mate, could you tell us how you spent Christmas Eve in 2007? Yeah, um, it wasn't my best Christmas. Uh, I'll, I'll start there. But I, I was three months into a sixth month tour of duty of Afghanistan. Um, it was my first tour of Afghanistan. I, I had done Iraq previously in 2003. Uh, but this was my, my first tour of Afghanistan, my first six month tour. The the other ones were, were half the, the duration. And I was second in command of a group of eight men out on a routine foot patrol. Now, earlier in the day, we had mounted this foot patrol. There were, there were two groups of eight men. Um, and the idea was that we would leave our patrol base that we were living in out of the rear gate. And one group would go north, one group would go south. We were told to patrol the immediate perimeter of our camp, uh, pushing no more than 300 meters from the perimeter wall. And then both groups would meet at the front entrance of camp. So now the opposite side where we would secure a location, close things down and finish up for the day. So in terms of what we had done leading up to that day, this was very, very basic, very low level kind of infantry style soldiering. We had 
not received any intelligence from any of our sources to say that there was any reason for us to be more concerned than we had been to this point. So as far as we were concerned, there were two groups of eight men going out the back door, going for a walk and then coming in the front door and then taking some time off to enjoy Christmas. So pretty routine, you thought? Not not, not even, even routine. It was so easy. It, it was laughable. We were just literally out for a walk, right? So they gave us the green light and we opened the rear entrance of camp and we left. I was second in command of the guys who went north, the other guys went south and we went out and we did what we were tasked to do. About five hours later, uh, both groups of men now found themselves at the opposite side of camp, ready to finish up for the day and, and go back in and try our best given our situation to enjoy Christmas. Now the group that I was in were on a high piece of ground, what we called the North Fort. It was one of our target indicators if we ever came into contact with the enemy. Beneath us slightly was the the base that we had been working out of. And then down beneath that, just off to the side of the main dirt road that ran through the area, was the other group of men that we had left with earlier in the day. So because we're on the high ground, we're in a very tactically advantageous position because not only can we see everything around us, but when you're in a firefight, it's a lot easier to fight going downhill than it is up. So our job in that scenario is to give what we call overwatch to the other section, which is protection. So we'll get into fire positions, we'll be secure, we'll protect them. They'll go back into camp, get behind the perimeter wall where they're safe. They'll return the favor so we can come off the high feature, go into camp and finish up. Nothing difficult about that at all. It's what we call SOP, standard operating procedures, done it a million times. So we're on the high feature, and the guy in charge, Corporal Sean Halesby, starts giving his half of the section their fire positions and their what we call arcs of fire and their areas of, areas of responsibility. I take my half and about four meters in front of me, you got we're, so we're on like a ridge line, right? On like the kind of cliff edge type thing. There was the, this bowl in the ground. Now, normally, if you're out patrolling and you go firm and you stop, you want to get behind a building a wall, a tree, a rock, or something that's going to give you cover from view and cover from fire. But we didn't have any of those luxuries being up on this high ground. So in my mind, I looked around and I thought, right, there's a little bowl on the ground there. We jump in there, get on our bellies. Anybody looking up at us is going to have a very difficult time seeing us, which means they'll have a very difficult time engaging us in a firefight. So given our terrain, our environment and the situation, in my mind, that was our best option for protection. So I jumped into this shallow bowl in the ground. The other guys jumped in behind me. They all knew what they were doing, so they started taking their fire positions. I stood back and observed. There were a couple of things I had to do, a couple of checks I had to make so that we were defensively as, as sound as we could be. And then when they were happy and I was happy, I started slowly walking over towards the position that I had selected for myself. And as I got there, I went to get down to my stomach and as I put my right knee on the floor, uh, that was the moment that I, I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. So it was on your knee? That's I, I, I knelt on it, yeah. Yeah, and, and I remember... Did they go off straight away? It did, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it, is it, I don't know how it works, is it pressurised? So you stand on it and is it when the pressure comes off or is it... There, there are they just, thousands of ways. They can oh, be controlled it? by um, uh, a wire... And, and manually detonated. They oh, can be right. controlled by mobile phones. They can be controlled by, like you said, someone stands on yeah. it. It might be pressure plate. There's a million ways, but oh, is it? what I stood on was an anti-personnel mine, which is designed to, is only designed to blow like a foot off. And the idea being that when your comrades come to give you first aid, the enemy jump over the brow of a hill with AK-47s and then spray everybody and take everyone out, right? It's not designed to kill you. But on top of the anti-personnel mine, they had put a 107 millimeter Chinese rocket warhead, which is like a showed launch rocket that will take the side of a house off. So I stood on the warhead. The warhead put pressure on the mine. In the mine, the two plates touched, the mine exploded, then the warhead exploded, and then I exploded. So if this thing, and this is the only way, and I don't, I don't think about this a lot, but I've thought about it over the years. If this thing had gone directly upwards, mm -hmm. then there would be nothing to me left, just a pink cloud. 
But I think because we're in this shallow bowl, it must have been at some sort of an angle. And as I've gone down, it's maybe it gone at a 45 degree, yeah, gone away from the which is why it took my right arm off, left my, I got a little bit of shrapnel damage on my palm, but my left hand is fine. And it took both my legs off. And on my, the inside of my left thigh, there's a big chunk of flesh missing. So it's almost like it's side swept me mm. um, rather than go straight up. But the force of that blast would have literally vaporized me had it gone directly mm. up from underneath me. That's the only way that, that I can think, I'm not going to say that I survived because what happened after is why I survived. But the only reason I wasn't completely vaporized yeah, okay. when, it, when it exploded. Did, it, did, it, did the blast hit anybody else or was it just you? There was one guy injured. He got shrapnel in his back and shrapnel in his tricep, but everyone else was fine. I, yeah. I was the, the main casualty. Okay. Um, and there were six of these devices scattered around when it exploded, it obviously cleared a lot of the sand and the, the mm. ground I was, around I was about it. to say that. I was like, was there more in that area? And then when that happened, so they then sweep for that type of stuff in the, in the whole perimeter or was it just... So we were working with some American Special Forces guys mm -hmm. and one of their jobs in this instance is to go in and clear an area and then write a report, which is why I know that this little bow that we were in was now 12 feet deep by 15 feet around and there were six other devices around me because I've read the report. Um, now, when you want to talk about casualty evacuations, if you could picture the worst scenario possible to evacuate someone from, that was it. I'm in a 15 foot by 12 foot crater. I've got six devices around me. I'm on high ground. I've lost three limbs and I'm bleeding profusely from all three of them. It doesn't get much more difficult than that. Man, you know, I haven't yeah. lost a foot on the flat ground, mm. you know, where it's easy to get I can't even to imagine that scenario. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. Like in my head, I'm trying to picture that and you, and you just can't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like exactly. It must, nuts. Yeah, were, no. you, were you conscious? Yep. Yeah. And what conscious was, at all. What was, the, what was the state of reality like at that point for you? It, it's, the whole thing's very surreal, mm. right? It do, it's hard to explain. So there was no pain. Was it not? And I remember when all the dust settled, because the terrain we're working in is very sandy and dusty. So initially there's this huge dust cloud and I can't see anything. But when it settled and I realized what had happened, I looked down to where my legs should have been and, and they were gone. And then there was blood and claret and fluid pouring out, but there was no pain. And it's almost like, it felt like a dream. And I'm looking at it and my, my brain just couldn't process it. It's like this, surely if this is real, then I'll be in immense pain. But I wasn't. You didn't have any pain? It was just like, a, if you imagine pins and needles, right? And yeah. times it by 10,000. Right. It was just, vroom, 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 yeah. vroom, this really intense throbbing. And it, it was more annoying than it was painful. Um, and then I noticed my arm after that. Uh, I kind of took my attention away from my legs to... I remember thinking about my team and just kind of snapping out of it instantly and trying to see where they were. And I saw my arm, which was still attached to my body, but completely the, the bicep and the forearm shredded, all the bones inside were shattered. Um, and again, just a real intense kind of throbbing pins and needles feeling. Um, and, and I remember thinking there's there's no way it's, it's strange, right? I remember thinking, there's no way I'll survive this because I'm in the worst possible situation you could be in. Was that your first thought? Like when you come around and realize what happened, was it like, oh, I'm going to die? No. Was it not? My, my first thought yeah. was I was angry and I was embarrassed. Embarrassed? And I was guilty. I was angry because the way we're trained in, in the Royal Marines is that we should be able to go toe to toe with anybody, right? Whether it's in a firefight, a knife fight, a fist fight, that's what we're trained to do. And in my mind, and we had these conversations before me and the lads and said, you've got to be pretty stupid to stand on a landmine <laughs> because the terrain that you work in, it's not like a sandy beach where you can dig a hole, bury something, and then you, there's no ground sign. It's hard, compact, like clay type of sand. So when you're digging in it, you just leave ground sign everywhere and you can see. So I'm just like, you got to be dumb if you're going to stand on a landmine. But I think where it had rained and we we're in this bowl, it had smoothed it all out so you couldn't see anything. So I, I remember immediately thinking, you're the dickhead 
that we were that's talking about the other day. Know, that, is fucking, <laughs> that is fucking mental though. That. That's one I of your first thoughts yeah. after yeah. after something like that happening is, yeah. I'm a fucking dickhead. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know no, what I mean? Exactly like, what I that's fucking mad. And then I felt embarrassed because of the conversation we had about how stupid you've got to be to set off an ID. And then the guilt set in because I thought what I said earlier about how sometimes when they plant these things, the, the idea is that you maim somebody, they come help and then they come over the, the brow of the hill with the AKs. Yeah. And and I just lying there thinking, waiting to hear AK-47 fire, thinking I've got everybody killed. But fortunately, that wasn't what happened. You know, and I'm a father of three, but I only had um, one kid when this happened. My daughter, Kezia, she was two years old. Yeah. And, and it sounds like there's a, you know, like I'm lying there for 10 minutes, enjoying myself, going through this thought process is a lot you think about in yeah, very, very awesome. quick succession. Mm. And I immediately then thought about her and thought if I survived this, I mean, she's from a previous relationship as well. So I didn't have a very consistent relationship with her because I didn't get on with her mum. And I thought if I survive this and go back home, I'm gonna have no relationship with her because how can I pick my daughter from school in a wheelchair with no legs and one arm? Because that's bound to lead to bullying, right? And then she's probably gonna hate me and not want me around because I'm, causing grief in her life and all these crazy weird thoughts go on. And then I remember thinking, do you know what? If I die now, and it's bizarre because given the situation, it was a very real possibility, but in the back of my mind, I knew it wasn't gonna happen because I knew the lads would do whatever it took to get me out of there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I remember thinking that if I die now, I'm good to go because to me, this is honorable and I would die doing something noble and even though my daughter won't remember me, she can hopefully grow up proud knowing that I did die doing something honorable. So I, I took my helmet off and I threw my helmet and I closed my eyes. And because I'm in this huge crater now, there's a like an incline behind me. So I slumped the back against this incline, closed my eyes and just pretended I was on a beach, just chilling. And it was bizarrely relaxing. I was about to say, was it peaceful at that yeah. point? You just thought... Yeah, it, it felt really calm and, and relaxed. And I just, and I, I, I thought all that's going to happen now. And you, you start to feel exhausted, like more tired than you've ever felt in your life, right? It's just drained. Like you can feel the life draining out your body. And I thought, okay, all that will happen now is I'll fall asleep, but this time I won't wake up. And that's what it's like. It's like if you're tired at the end of a long week and you go, and you know, those times when you, your head hits the pillow and you're out. It was like that. It's me every night, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I remember thinking, you know, this time I just won't wait. I just won't wake up. And I was good to go. I was yeah. happy with that. And then, you know, obviously the lads do what the lads do best and they kicked in and they were incredible and, and they did everything that they should have done perfectly. And they got me out of there. And a medic came and gave me pain relief and put tourniquets on and cut me out the minefield, got me to a helicopter land. Sorry, what, what was that they put on? What was it? Tourniquets. What? Oh, is that so to like, stop the bleeding? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like a belt type thing okay, to stop cool. stem the bleeding. Um, and then got me to the helicopter land site back in our camp where it was a bit more secure. How big are the camps? Are they huge or like... So I say, say, uh, yeah, I I say mean, camp, it's, right? it's not a camp. It's a, it's a forward operating base. So it's right. basically you have these things called Hesco barriers. So if you imagine a square made out of fencing right. with a sandbag in just full of grit and sand and dirt, that's, imagine that two yeah. or three high, that's, your, that's all you've got. You live, you live within that for your time there. There are camps out there, Camp Bastion, Camp Kandahar, they're airfields, they're massive, like six, seven miles wide. Um, but we, weren't, we didn't stay in those. Um, that was kind of more for the, the back end logistical people to, to start. I was just trying to picture it like when you were saying it's like a five hour, you know, we went out for a walk. Yeah, but that's because of the terrain. So you're not, it's, it's not flat. We're climbing up mountains and it's up and down. And, you know, you've got to stop because it's so hot. You have to be hydrated and you have conversations with the, the civilians in the yeah. villages. So it's not like you're, you're not, you're just out. Yeah. Not, I'm going to say chilling, but you've got a job to do, right? Mm, and yeah. you're not rushing it. Yeah, so cool. it took about five hours. Mm. So how long was it from from getting from the site to, to the helipad? I, I don't know, mm. um, realistically, but I would say it couldn't have been more than half an hour. Okay. Um, and, and during that period, like, did your state of consciousness change? Did the pain kick in or like your state of awareness? Did that change at all during that period of going from chilling on the beach to, to getting to the helipad? No, not until the helicopter landed. Um, and when 
when it did land, that was when I blacked out. Okay. And, you know, felt like I was just drifting off to sleep. Mm. Really? Yeah, that was the last thing I can remember. Okay. This helicopter landed. And when did you next wake up? 20th of December in Birmingham. So a few days later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is 24th of December that I got injured on Christmas yeah. Eve. And then four days later, I woke up in, in ITU in Birmingham. That yeah. was something fucking... Mm. You could never imagine that, could you? Like, no, do you know what I mean? Nuts. Like four days. So, mm. so what happens? So when, once you blacked out, they got you onto the chopper. Mm -hmm. And what, what happened during that period? So I don't remember any of that, mm -hmm. but I, I, I've met the entire medical team. Yeah. And uh, so this is what they told me happened. So they, they had me and the other guy that I said got shrapnel in his back and in his tricep. And they put us on the back of this Chinook. And the way they prioritize casualties in, in this situation, it sounds really harsh, but if you have a guy who's dead and a guy that's dying, you have to ignore the dead guy because you don't want two dead guys. So they felt for a pulse. I didn't have one. They couldn't get any fluids into me because all my veins had collapsed because of the blood loss. And then they went to put an oxygen mask on me and it should have steamed up to show I was breathing, but it didn't. So they went, right, he's gone. Throw him in the corner. Everyone get to work on this guy. As a medic walked past me to get some kit to go and work on the other guy, this medic said my eyes started to, to flutter, which meant my heart was beating. Mm. So he alerted some of the other medics and they came over and they got to work on me. Now, three days before I was injured, whoever's in charge of the military medical world had given the green light for this new technique to be used where if you can't get fluids into somebody through their veins with the intravenous line, you can drill into their tibia and their fibia, right? And you can successfully administer fluids that way. Problem being, I didn't have a tibia or a fibia either side because they've been destroyed by the landmine. So the medics decided, and this had never been done ever. This wasn't theorized or even talked about. Like no one had any idea what they were doing, but they just got this medical drill, two medical drills, and one drilled in the front of my hip, one drilled in the back of my hip. They put the intravenous lines in. The first time it failed, they said that my skin was too loose. So they tightened it up, went back in again. Second time the line bit, fluids went in. Three minutes later, I'm awake, responsive, and talking about how much my ass hurt. <laughs> Um, which is not a marine thing. It's apparently... <laughs> probably is as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, probably is a little bit of that, but um, it's a side effect apparently of mass amounts of morphine. Yeah, okay. So because I had so much morphine from the medic to the medics on the back, mm -hmm. that was a really positive sign. Yeah. They knew that, that I was going to survive because of that. So they flew me back to a place called Camp Bastion, took me to the field hospital. Obviously these were traumatic amputations, so it was a mess. So the surgeons had to have a look at the damage and then decide where the healthy flesh and, and tissue was and then amputated both my legs above the knee and my right arm above mm. the elbow. And I think you were the first in the UK to have a triple amputation and survive since, the conflict, right? Since the Second World War, I think. Is it? Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So you woke up four or five days later. Yeah. Um, had they already done that procedure at that point? They did it in Afghanistan. Did they? Okay. Yeah, yeah. they got amputated in a tent in a field hospital in Afghanistan, got me back and then... I woke up very briefly on the 28th of December. I remember I woke up and I was choking on a feeding tube. So this this nurse took the, the mask off. She pulled the tube out of my throat. I remember feeling exhausted and I could, I could hear voices around me. And I think because of the drugs I was on, everything was echoing, but I recognized like my wife's voice. And I remember trying to open my eyes and it felt like I had fish hooks in my eyes with weights on it. And I, I was focusing every ounce of strength I had to my eyelids to open them and I couldn't do it. I was that physically drained. Mm. And I was trying to talk and, and I could hardly talk and I was mumbling and they took the mask off me and, and made sure that I had a bit of space and wasn't freaking out too much. And I hired Becky beside me. I actually proposed to her right then and there. And then I was awake for about 15 seconds pass back out again. And the next day, they, I think they reduced my medication to bring me out of the drug-induced coma, where I was a little bit more compass menace and understood a bit more about what was going on. Yeah, okay. So yeah. what was your what was your kind of initial thought? Because I guess if it was really surreal and you blacked out during periods, it must have been a point where you woke up and you thought we're coming out of a dream, right? Mm. Or not? 
those drugs they give you are pretty cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like you, Coming you out wake a trip up then. <laughs> and you just don't care about anything. Yeah, okay. I, I don't oh, really. know exactly what it was they give me. I'm pretty sure at various points I was on ketamine. Yeah. I was about to and say I've been on ketamine before and all I could feel was my head. I broke just, my arm yeah. and they give me ketamine and I was and laid down. I was with Kirsty and I was going, Kirst, I can only feel my fucking face. I was about to yeah. say, man, I don't think we're going to be talking about that sort of stuff at parties nah. on this nah. podcast. <laughs> I was in jesters yeah. and I was on ketamine. Yeah. Yeah. I was about to say, yeah, me too. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah. nah, nah. you just... From a doctor, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I just remember not caring about much and being really happy. And what they did was, I only spent seven days in intensive care that that I was conscious for. And each day they gradually, I think, reduced my medication so that I became more aware of my situation and um, not accepting, but understanding of it. So initially I, I remember thinking I just lost a couple of toes and some fingers on my right hand. And then like the day after I was like, okay, I've lost my feet and these fingers. Then it was, no, 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 you've lost your legs above the knee you know, on day four and day five. And on day seven, I remember, um, and because of these drugs, I'd been hallucinating a lot. Mm -hmm. So you remember like, you remember the Fresh Prince of Belair? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember you had that kind of high fade brick square Lego block haircut? Mm -hmm. yeah. So like three Will Smiths came to visit me. One had the small cut, one was like medium. Remember the kid and play from House Party? And mm -hmm. one had this massive, <laughs> yeah. and these three Will Smiths kept visiting me and talking to me in, in this Fresh Prince of Belair <laughs> days. And there was an eight foot bottle of ketchup in the room. And people would visit me and they would have metal waste paper baskets yeah. on their head and all these crazy things. So, And then you think this is the drugs, not the lads just winding you up yeah, the whole yeah, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Sneaking in big bottles of fucking ketchup. You just, you fuck just yeah. become a little bit used to not understanding everything. And, you know, okay, I'm hallucinating. I know that now. And on the seventh day, I pulled my right arm out from under the bed sheet and tried to scratch my nose, which I had been doing successfully for the previous six days. <laughs> And as I pulled my arm out, I looked at it and I kind of giggled a bit. And the nurse was like, what are you laughing at, Mark? I said, I'm hallucinating again. Looks like my arm's falling off. And she just looked at me like, and I was like, okay, I think I get it now. We're on day seven. It's both legs above the knee, right arm above the elbow. And it, it's so bizarre. Like, I don't know if they designed it that way or if it was just luck, but it, it kind of panned out perfectly that I was able to understand and accept that at that point the full extent of my injuries. It wasn't like a cold turkey, wake up, this is it. Mm. And uh, after that seventh day, they, they took me out and moved me upstairs to a single man room and continued to reduce the medication and, and bring me back more into the real world so we could figure out a plan with what we were going to do moving forward. What was the pain like at that point? Like obviously once they reduced the drugs and stuff, obviously you'd have had big wounds and whatever else. What was the pain like? Yeah, but, I mean, Can they give remember? you this little button, right? And they say... <laughs> that you press that and it gives you morphine, but I don't know if it's like a placebo thing, mm. um, but it wasn't comfortable. Yeah. And you know, cause you're on so medica much medication, you, you're like constipated all the time. And I had a big hole in my left hand. I could only use two fingers so I could hardly move anywhere. I couldn't sit up for probably the first two weeks because although I was fit and strong, it's a different kind of strength than your core and your glutes and you had to try and even just sit up. And because you didn't have the legs as an anchor point, it was like one of them weebles that you just, you sat up and flop back down again. So trying to deal with it all. And I had these, it was like a sponge in my left thigh with a tube coming out of it. I was just constantly sucking uh, dirt and sand and stuff because it was such an open wound to stop the infections. So I was just wired up to so much stuff. Did you get any infections or anything from any of it? No, I had, I had three operations in that first six weeks. And they were called, they called them debridling, which is, they explained it to me as basically getting a wire brush and just scrubbing all the dirt and sand out of your wounds. And then you spend a day or a couple of days recovering from that. But I only had three operations uh, after I was injured. I've got friends who are on That's crazy, 60 yeah. plus mm -hmm. that whose injuries on the surface don't look as severe as mine, mm -hmm. but internal injuries and all that, which I was fortunate enough not to suffer with, they're, they're constantly having operations. So you know, a week in intensive care, three operations, six weeks in total in hospital, and I was done, ready for rehab. Which seems absolutely, you know, insane, really, compared yeah. to what, what actually happened to you. Yeah, it was a quick process. Yeah. Mm. So talk us through the rehab then, because you've obviously gone on to do some insane things. I mean, drove in, no problem, walked mm -hmm. in, no problem. 
you know, you're a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu mm -hmm. and actually winning fucking matches against, yep. you know, for, for sort of fully, for sort of able people. So you've obviously not, it's not held you back, you know, so talk us through how you went from there to, to now. So there, there's a couple of things really. I, I knew from the beginning and I've known this since I was a kid <clears throat> that if you want to excel at anything, the, the quickest and fastest way for you to do that is to get mentors that have achieved what you want to achieve and just ask them to help you. So I did that. I, I found a guy because there were no triple amputees in the UK. That, being an amputee can get quite complex. You've got above knee, below knee, lists like that. And, you know, and I'm above my bo both my knees. So it's three to 500% more energy for me to do anything than anybody else. And I've lost my dominant arm above the elbow. So it's a pretty difficult situation to be in. And there was nobody in the UK with similar injuries that, and I, and I mean this respectfully, but that wasn't restricted to a wheelchair. They were using wheelchairs more than they were using prosthetics. But I found a guy in America who was hit by a train in 2002, who was doing amazing things that I wanted to do. So I reached out to him very early and asked him and his team if they could mentor me and give me some advice because they've been doing it for six years. So I think I can take six years of their success and their failures and cram it into a couple of weeks, which is what I did. But then I also set myself goals, right, right, right from the, the get-go. You know, I was, we deployed in September. I was injured on Christmas Eve. The first week I got to rehab was February 2008, and my unit still had seven or eight weeks of their deployment left. Now, I knew when they came back, they'd get nine or ten weeks leave to go and be with their families. And then when that was over, they go back to our unit and we have a medals parade, which is where every man and woman from the unit, attached ranks and everyone, will come to the unit with their families and friends from all over the world and a VIP will present us with our operational service medals. So when I got to rehab, my goal was to get to that medals parade and where everyone will expect me to be in a wheelchair and be pushed on, I wanted to be on prosthetics, stood up, I wanted to walk on and stand tall, shoulder to shoulder with the guys that I fought with. And everyone thought it was mad that like, there's no way you'll do it. Like we don't even know how to deal with you, let alone get you to a level where you can do that in such a short space of time. But I had the, I had the guys over in America that were giving me some, some help and advice. And I just found having the goal really, really helped me. Cause like, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like every morning in rehab, my groin's cut. I've got blisters on the end of my leg. My back physique is going to snap. I am exhausted every day I'm, I'm going through four or five shirts because of the sweat of like like I mean learning to walk I thought it'd be easy it was it was ridiculously hard mm. like, everything about it was just it just nearly it nearly broke me what aspect of it's the hardest is it like just the actual physical side of it or is it like the mental side of actually walking again it's does both. that make sense like it's, it's definitely both but I, I went into the physical side thinking I can handle this no problem but that wasn't the case because right. You know, when you walk now, you guys, you've got, you probably don't even realize that you've got your toes and your ankles and you've got flexion in your toes and ankles and you've got calf muscles and knees and ligaments and tendons. All I've got is my ass muscles. I've got some hamstrings and quads that don't work, a bit of lower back and some core. And that's how I have to drive my prosthetics to walk. Mm. So it takes three to 500% more energy for me to do anything than an able-bodied person. You never think of that though. No. I never, you know, you've just said that I mean. then. I've never, ever thought of that. So people see me now life. mincing around all day long. I don't use a wheelchair. I walk around town. I'm in Morrison's around. and all this lot. And it looks easy. It was ridiculously hard in the beginning. And not just that, it's, it doesn't feel anything like what it feels like for you to walk. Because I, I, know, I know both sides of the coin. I've had legs for 24 years and now I've not had them for 15, 16 years. You have to learn a new technique. And it's frustrating trying to get your head around it. You know what I mean? It's like being a baby again, but with 24 years experience. And I had to learn that technique. I think the first time I ever became aware of you, I was watching an Instagram video and I think you were doing like, uh, you were doing a run, mm. something like that. I think it was with Ben. Mm -hmm. And um, he fell over. Yep. And I could see the frustration in your eyes, and, mm. but you just fucking got back up like as if it was nothing. And you, you see, running's even on. harder. Yeah, I run can imagine. Like, yeah. like six to 800% more energy. Because yeah. This is the way I try to explain it to people, right? I don't know if it was just me that did this when I was a kid, but when you get down on your knees, you grab like the laces of your shoe, you pull the heel of your foot up to your ass and you walk around the house on, on your, like that. That is what, <laughs> imagine, that. so imagine. Have you done that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you haven't, have a go after this. Yeah. Right. 
but I'll, go, that, I'll go over and try it. That's Pull your arms like. in as well. Yeah, put Pull your, your arms, arms in as, as well. well. <laughs> but um, that is what it's like when you learn to walk prosthetics. Yeah, it's like okay. walking around on your knees. So imagine imagine going to, to Morrison shopping and doing it all on your knees. Yeah. Imagine how exhausted you'd be, right? And putting one arm behind your back, getting your weaker arm and pushing a trolley, picking everything off the shelf. That's what it's like. It, it was. Your body obviously adjusts over the years and you get fitter and more adapt to it. But in the beginning, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah. And it's hard. it was hard for someone like me, you know, being a Royal Marine with a, with a large ego to be able to deal with that. I'm like, I'm someone of the fittest dudes on the planet and I can't even walk around the shopping center mm. without being exhausted. It was hard. Was there any particular low point that you had? when? Oh, you was, was there anything particular that you really thought, oh, I can't handle this, so I'm going to give up with this? And maybe not like, not not suicide, but you're just gonna you were just gonna give up trying to yeah. walk, or you were gonna give up. You know, you was gonna say, "I'm gonna just stay in a wheelchair." Is mm -hmm. there any point like that? So, three weeks after I was injured, and I'm in hospital with the tubes in, I get the the cliche chat from the doctor telling me I've got zero chance of ever being able to walk again because that, of the things I've just said, said to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's too difficult, too painful, takes too much energy, and that made me suicidal. A week after that, I was allowed out of the hospital and my family were in a flat across the road and they put me in a wheelchair. Now, when you've got one arm, whatever arm it is you've got on the on the wheel of the chair, you've got one hand, one kind of ring to go forward and back and another ring to go left and right. So it's a bit wider than a regular wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So I got through the, it's a tower block of, that we were staying in. So I got through the communal entrance, got through the front door, but couldn't access any of the rooms in the flat because of this wide wheelchair. So I had to sit in the hallway and eat my dinner. I had to piss in milk bottles because I couldn't get in the toilet. And in the evening, we found out I was allowed, this is the first time I was allowed to stay out of a hospital environment. So I was sleeping in the flat with, with Becky, my, my now wife. And we figured out like if we, someone lifted me out of the chair, collapsed the chair, put it through the door, opened it up and then walked me through, I could get through into a room. And in hospital, I had brushed my teeth and shaved in like a head you know, a mirror that goes from your neck up. Never seen my body in a full length mirror to that point for those first couple of weeks. I used to be six foot two. At my, my heaviest and fittest, I was 16 stone. At this point, without prosthetics, I'm like three and a half foot tall. Because of the limb loss and the infections I was fighting, I was about eight stone 11. And I wheeled past that mirror and I had this jacket on and where my right arm should have been, the arm of the jacket was just flapping down what was left of my legs was poking out the end of these shorts and I looked in the mirror and I, I don't mind admitting this, I spent the entire night crying about it. Like, I can't live like this. I don't think anyone would blame you though. My whole, my whole identity was wrapped up in my physicality of being strong and fit and, and healthy and all this lot. And that was gone. I looked like a skeleton. It was, it was horrendous. And I just spent the whole night with Becky in that uh, flat, in that bedroom, just crying. And I didn't want to do it and I wanted to, to kill myself. But I'm a big fan of having a good cry and a purge every once in a while and it, and it helps. And I got up the next day and I'm like, right, fuck this. Like, give me the legs, give me a target and let's just go. And we went, I did like two more weeks, I think, in hospital, then went to rehab, but I was I was refocused. And I had, I had been visited by an amputee in hospital. I had found a mentor online, so I saw what was possible if I put the hard work and effort in, I, I thought it was going to be a lot easier than it was. Mm. Um, and it, it did push me to the point of wanting to quit at, at certain times. And I remember when I was in rehab, I was the, at that time, I was the only triple amputee in there. And I used to get really pissed off when I'd see a guy with a foot missing, get up in the morning, like clip his leg on and walk out. And it took me an hour and a half to get dressed. And I was a sweaty mess and my legs were twisted and I couldn't balance and I had a crutch with me and it would take me all morning just to go and have breakfast. And I was like, this isn't fair. Like these guys just get up in the morning, clip a leg on and they walk out and their life's no different. And I used to get really, really pissed off about it. Yeah, but and, it's really fucking bitter. I, yeah. I would probably be like a and, bitter, but- like, And it used to make me want to quit. And I'll tell you what happened, right? A friend of mine was in rehab as well and he was, I'm probably going to get the, the term wrong, I think a tetraplegic, right? So basically his arms, all he could do was just gently move his head like this. He couldn't control his arms or anything really from his, his neck down. He had been in Norway, he was a Marine as well. 
and he had dived in the snow to do a snow angel and it broke his back, right? And I was having this really shitty time in rehab where I was thinking of quitting all the time, feeling sorry for myself. And I remember having lunch with him and I, I don't know where this thought came from, but my legs were just raw and throbbing from wearing prosthetics. And I remember talking to him and thinking, this guy has both his arms and both his legs, but they'll never work again, ever. I've got no legs and one arm, but I have prosthetics. And if I put the effort in, I will be able to walk again. And then I flipped it and thought, if I was him sat looking at me and I bitched out and quit because it was a little bit painful and it took a bit of effort and a bit more energy, I'd be so angry. I'd be like, you ungrateful prick. My legs are never going to work. You've got the chance and you've just given up. And I remember sitting there thinking, shit, you know, I can't just quit. I've got an opportunity and I'm very lucky to have this opportunity. I just need to get my head down and start working hard. And that's what I did. I, my perspective changed completely. And I was like, right, let's go. And then I just started, you know, busting it every day, getting up, had that goal set, had some support and, and mentors to help me if I had any questions and just, just hustled every day. Crazy how someone else is, you know, you looking at him has made you like want to go and, and do better for yourself. Yeah. You know, it's a really odd, really odd way of it working, how your mind yeah. works. It's just perspective. Yeah. It is. It's just yeah, perspective. It is, yeah. It's like, you know. But if you've some... never seen that, you might have given up or you might have yeah. like at some point. 100%. But you, you just look at anyone that, you know, adversity to some people nowadays is not getting 5G on their phone. Right. <laughs> and then you look at other people in other parts of the, in the world and you're like, would you swap places with them person? With, with that person? Probably not. They've got it a lot worse than you have. So having 5G, not having 5G on your phone, isn't that big a deal, mm -hmm. right? It's perspective. You know, you've got you to take a step back, look at the bigger picture and be like, actually, I'm pretty lucky. You know, I've got these 80,000 pound prosthetic legs. I've got this team around me. I've got everything I need on hand. It's like, almost like being an elite athlete, right? You've got this massive experienced team around you but you're the one with the spotlight on you that's got to put the physical and mental work in constantly while these team are supporting you in the background. And uh, a couple of things that happened over the years, you know, a couple of things that caused me to change my mindset and to readjust a little bit and to to dig a little deeper and push on through some challenging times. But it was it just, you know, you've got to kind of take a step back sometimes and, and have a word with yourself and look at the big picture. Mm. yeah okay it, it's yeah it's mad isn't it because we said at the beginning we want to sort of chat about men's mental health mm -hmm. um and you've just talked through like insane fucking adversity there mm -hmm. but so many people struggle now don't they and it's not just a male problem everybody fucking gets depressed and, and struggles but i think certainly with men you know you, you see a real a huge amount at the moment um mm -hmm. but low moods um and obviously suicide rates are quite high um and you get sort of obviously you know civilians and veterans as well who struggle um, and I guess just thinking about veterans, I know many like do amazing things, but some mm -hmm. struggle, mm -hmm. um, things like substance abuse, whether it be drugs or alcohol. Um, what do you, what do you think that the difference is between like, I guess you, um, and, and everybody else? Like what, what advice could you give to people to help try and pull them out of that, that sort of dark place they might be in? Um, so I think first of all, th this might sound a little bit harsh, right? And, and people might not like what I'm going to say now, but you got to take a bit of personal responsibility, right? You can't expect anybody to come swooping in to save the day for you. That's just not how it works, right? By all means, and I absolutely encourage getting a good support system around you, but you've got to put the hard yards in. You've got to do the, you know, the, the hard work and get inside your head and, and figure out what's going on, what you want to do, build a support system around you, set the goals for yourself, take action on those goals, manage the highs, manage the lows. You've got to do it yourself predominantly. But having good people around you is massive. Like I'm, I am brutal now with who I will spend my time with. And you know, you have these people, I call them morale vampires, right? They're those guys that we could be having a great time here, right? And that one person walks in and the mood goes down. Or we could be having a shit time here and that one person walks in and the mood goes through the roof because they're the life of the party. They're always funny and bubbly. You want to get around more people like that, more people with drive, ambition. Like 
Ricky, right? Ricky's so similar to me. He loves reading personal development books. He loves training. He loves trying to improve himself all the time. And I, and I buzz off him being around him. And I surround myself with people like him. And if people are, we were having this conversation earlier, me and Ricky, about people in your life that make deposits or withdrawals. They're either people trying to take, 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 take from you all the time and drain you, or they'll give, 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 or there's a little bit of both. You want to try and build the people around you that make you feel good, that are on the same mission that you're on you know, and, and stay away from the ones that just suck the life out of you. And, you know, it sounds really kind of elitist and, and hardcore, but, you know, we're not here for that long mm -hmm. and we got to make the most of it and enjoy this experience that we've got. And to do that, you've got to get around people that, that light you up and push you on to mm. be the best version of yourself that you can be. Yeah, no, I can agree more. We talk about that all the time, actually, don't we? Oh, fucking hell, yeah. Mm, to yeah. It, yeah. We, I've got a real problem with people that just take, take, take. Mm. And um, I think the more... As you get older, I think you realise that those people that have clung, clung on to you for years or clung into your group or into your... And then you kind of realise one day, you're like, yeah, they're just fucking using you for whatever reason, mm -hmm. just, to, just to better themselves or whatever. And do you know what's funny? Like most of the time you find those people, they might start talking shit about you to other people. Oh, he's changed. He's not the same anymore. I'm like, damn fucking right I've changed. <laughs> Why do I want to be the same person that I was when I'm... 40 that I was when I was 18, mm. running around downtown, drinking, partying and throwing up in the street. I don't need doing that when I'm 40. That's ridiculous. Mm, yeah. I want to be grown. I've got a family. I've got responsibilities. I want to build stuff, build a yeah. life, build businesses, build friendship circles and, and do all I think stuff like that comes out of jealousy though. Like I think you know who your real friends are when you start doing well. Yeah. If you start doing well, they either support you or you'll get the friends that will just bitch behind your back yeah. and be like, oh, why the fuck's he doing this? Why the fuck's he doing that? The circles get very small. Ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think if you do surround yourself with people that are moving forward all the time, you all go forward together. You mm -hmm. know? But if you, if you let that one person hold on to the back of you and you, yeah. you don't let them go, you know, they can pull you fucking back down. Yeah. Especially with your mood, like you said earlier, like your mood, if you've got that one mate who's always fucking depressed, always, you know, but doesn't do anything to help himself, always right. out on the piss, always cheating on his missus, always doing this, always doing that. And then they, they just become a fucking pain in the ass. And you feel sorry for them in a way because you want to help them. And, but you mm -hmm. try and help them over and over and over again. And then you find out, well, what do you do Saturday? Like, oh, when I, you know, yeah. run out and piss again. Yeah. You think you fucking dick. This is what I said about personal responsibility. They've got to take a bit of personal responsibility for themselves. And people reach that point at, at different parts along their journey. Some people never reach it, but some people will one day just have an epiphany. They'll wake up and be like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. I think like, sometimes it's triggers. It's triggers. Some, it's like their wife will leave them there. <laughs> yeah. Their kids will, you know, not want as much to do with them. Right. Or that. And then they think, oh fuck, am I, am I that much of a dick? But right. you can tell them, but it's sometimes it takes, act, like you said, action. You mm. know what I mean? To say, you know, get fucking yeah it's, it's it's almost like a three-year-old boy now it's almost like right raising a child isn't it something <laughs> yeah. literally he'll, he'll be doing something and his mum's like oh just, I'm just let him let him fail just let him fall down mm. he'll figure it out and yeah. then he'll sort of shit his sort of yeah. shit out people can change as well they can like realize that they are fucking dicks or they have you know when none of us are fucking perfect the way let's be honest we've all got our hang-ups or our, our bits and pieces but i guess that that's kind of what we're trying to achieve to some extent with this podcast though where we're we're kind of covering men's mental health and i mentioned it was kind of the overarching topic but it's not here to to tell guys it's going to be all right and to pat them on the back mm. it's to give them information that they can then take on board and actually apply to their own lives themselves mm -hmm. to better the situation and hopefully improve their mindset so that's i think that's a big one i think mean, yeah. it really is you mentioned about the social piece as well and i guess talking specifically about veterans um you do quite a bit with reorg yes um i guess most veterans will know about the charity but can you talk a little bit about that and some of the stuff that you've done with reorg to support veterans yeah so reorg is a charity. It started off with the the idea was that it would help serving and retired Royal Marines who were physically or mentally wounded through the vehicle of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. It gained a lot of popularity very quickly. So then went tri service to the Army, Navy and Air Force. Then it gained even more popularity. So we reached out to the emergency services community because we realized that they go through trauma mm, almost constantly. every day. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And then we realized that not everybody wants to wear pajamas and roll around with their mates getting sweaty. <laughs> Why not? So we, I don't know. I don't <laughs> I think that's fucking either, mental. But yeah. It's great. But then we branched out into like the fitness world, functional fitness, CrossFit, that kind of stuff. Because, and this is the thing that I advocate more than anything, physical fitness is the cure to 99% of people's problems, particularly, you know, mental health problems, because 
I'm, I'm not going to go and try and get scientific on it, but you know, the chemical releases, the endorphins, the dopamine hit, you just feel good. And I'll, in my opinion, human beings are at their happiest and most productive when they're growing and, and improving in their lives. And when it comes to fitness, particularly jujitsu, yeah, we were talking earlier, I'm in a phase right now where I feel flat and I'm not making any progress. But most of the time, I'm always making progress, even if it's like a little tiny bit and like a 1%. And that makes me feel good. If you don't have anything like that in your life, if you're just getting up, doing the nine to five, your diet shit, you don't go to the gym, you've got the bad circle of friends, it's all going to have a negative impact on your mental health. When if you flip the switch, you get a bit of a you know, routine going on, some habits, you get up, you train. Even People say they don't have enough time. I'm not talking about running a marathon every morning, 20 minutes of hit training in the morning, right? Before you go to work, boom, job done. Healthy breakfast, fasting, whatever you want to do, get to work. You know, in an ideal world, you're doing a job that you love, right? So you're a bit more enthusiastic, a bit more passionate. You've got good friends there that, you know, they're not going, oh, we're going to go down and get minging on the weekend. No, actually, I'm going to go spend time with my family, go to a personal development seminar, go into a music concert, you know, I'm not going to drink myself into a stupor on the weekend. You've got to put all these little pieces of the puzzle in place and they all have either a positive or a negative impact on your mental health and your mindset. And none of it's that difficult. Mm. This is one of the frustrating things <laughs> about it. You've just got to decide that that's what you're going to do, commit to it and then take action on it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, 100%. I think jujitsu is such a good medium as well because I think, and again, we've talked about this already and this applies, I think maybe more to just like non-servicemen and non-military uh blokes because i think you guys are how you form that camaraderie and the relationships and the bonds <clears throat> through the training and, and through your tours and, and through everything that you go through together you go through that kind of adversity physical adversity as part of the job yep and i think that from what I, i've not been in the military so i'm not gonna make out that i know but i'm assuming that the bonds that you you get with people as a result of that are quite strong, mm -hmm. um, like family, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people that maybe haven't been in the military, haven't been in jujitsu, like you say, have maybe got some shit friends around them or maybe no friends around them and they don't have people that they can truly kind of rely on and trust. Mm -hmm. And I think Brazilian jujitsu is amazing for that because you go in and you start meeting new people from all walks of life. You go through physical adversity together and mm -hmm. you're essentially playing the, a game of who's going to kill each other with whose body first, right? <laughs> right. So there's a level of trust with that. Yeah. Because, you know, not that he ever does, but if you were to get hold of my neck. Right. <laughs> one, day, one day. One yeah, day. Um, but, you know, he's, he's, you know, if he didn't let go, I'd be dead, right? Yeah. So there's a level of trust to that. If I tap your arm, you're going to let me go. And I think when you go through that, but it's the same with any, any group exercise, whether it's CrossFit, right. where you just go through it together, you form really good bonds with people. So I think Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but to your point, any exercise really, mm -hmm. but certainly exercise with others, I think has a huge impact, I think, on on people from a social component. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of people ask me, they're like, if you ask any veteran what they miss most about the military, they'll say it's the lads or, or the girls, yeah. right? And this is just my opinion, but it's pretty much what you just said. Like in the Royal Marines, you start on day one and you all go through the same training syllabus to get to the end to get your green beret, right? Now, whether that's in the same troop, whether someone did it 20 years before you, 20 years after you, if you meet that person, having never met them before, you know they've been through the same adversity and shared hardships that you've been through to earn that green beret. Same as jujitsu. You start on day one, you turn up, you get choked <laughs> up by a 15 year old that weighs six stone and you're like, I don't know what happened, but you stick with it and then you get a stripe. Then you get a blue belt and a purple belt. By the time you get to a black belt, I imagine, I'm not there yet, but everyone you meet, has been on that same journey. They've experienced the same highs, same lows. They've won comps, they've lost comps, but you've got that, that those shared experiences, right? And this, this is what real do, that you said about communities. But that could be the same in cycling. It could be the same in open water swimming. It could be the same in hiking, right? It's a group of people going through the same physical challenges of, you know, today I swam 110 meters instead of 100. Boom. Today I climbed you know, higher than I climbed last week on the mountain, boom. Today I cycled another 10 minutes, boom. And you're sharing, you're celebrating together, you're forming bonds and relationships through physical adversity. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's powerful, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's massively powerful. And I think the skills acquisition as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned about obviously goal setting and, and having purpose. And I think with jujitsu, um, you're always learning new skills. Yeah, that's and what one of my mates said to me when I when he started before me. Yeah, He was like, we were doing CrossFit together for a while. 
he started jiu-jitsu and then one of the things he said to me that that made me want to start was like as soon as you get injured with crossfit say you're injured for three months yeah you've lost all that hard work mm. he said with jiu-jitsu it's, it's a skill acquisition so yeah. what i learn i'm keeping you know what yeah. i mean it's yours isn't it then once you've got it it's yours yeah. where a lot of the other stuff is it's gone you yeah. know and obviously you can take breaks from jujitsu and come back to it and you may not be as sharp as you were but it, it doesn't really go does it you must know, remember to come back quick exactly yeah. yeah but we were talking about it offline before uh, before you came in and talking about how mark will like reflect on his jujitsu and just ponder mm. it and mm. and i think that's to your point as well yeah. you know you can still go and hang out and watch and you can still think and you can still watch tape and you can still learn so you're always learning with it i think every fucking bloke should try it it sounds mad yeah. like, obviously i'm really new to it but I think everyone should try it. Yeah. I say it because there's nothing better, is there? When you, when you fucking, like today I was knackered, mm. absolutely shattered, an hour rolling, shattered. Mm. But you feel so good after, don't you? Yeah. You know, I got chinned for an hour, but I was happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, like I get chinned all the time. I'm you know what constantly. Mean? And it's weird, isn't it? Me. It's a weird fucking, it's yeah. a weird feeling. And as well, I like it because I don't want to get punched in the face. Mm. You know, I'm not there. I'm not doing it to no, try yeah. and. You're dumb enough, mate, right? You can't, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Fuck me. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true, though, isn't it? I don't want to go into something where, you know, MMA and stuff like that, where you're going to get just chinned all the time and stuff like that. 33, I don't want to do that, you know? Whereas I like it that like you're still still fighting enough to know that you can handle yourself, but not enough that you're ever really going to hurt yourself. You know, I quite like that yeah. side of it. And it's mental, like, for me, you know, I, I'm missing three limbs. I'm, I was saying to you earlier, I'm going for a phase right now where. Everything feels a bit flat. I don't feel like I'm advancing. I feel like everyone's battering me. But if you put me now to roll with like a, a new blue belt or something, I could take them out. Like legit, legit. Do you know what I mean? And and that's from a holistic point of view, the big pictures, that skill acquisition you're talking about. I'm just forgetting about it because I'm rolling with brown belts, black belts. I'm 62, 63 kilos. No one is as little as I am, right? So everyone's bigger and heavier and stronger. And I forget that sometimes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just that it's a it's life skills as well that you, you're picking up when you're training. Yeah, and I think we always talk about how it humbles you as well, mm. kind of crushes your ego a little bit. Yeah, and, that, and kill, that kills mine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it will. It will. <laughs> but but I think that that releases like sometimes your ability to to take on new information and learn. Because I think if people have got a bit of an ego, they can be quite. Um, like arrogant and with information. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they won't listen to people because they think they know better. Um, you know, they won't do this because they think they've already tried it. But I think with something like jujitsu, again, that humbling experience just removes that and it just allows you to be a little bit more free with yeah. with the things you try and, and the things that you'll take on board and listen to. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's amazing. Everybody should try it for sure. Um, we, we talked, um, we're obviously talking about sort of mental health struggles just then and we, we kind of reference obviously veterans in particular um, talking about reorg and and you know some of the things that you know sort of blokes might have gone through in the military but just talking about I guess just civilian civvies um, and looking around online at the moment I know you kind of get online a little bit as we all do sadly but this seems like it's a bit of like a almost like a depression pandemic with blokes right and some youngsters that have been through very little in life they got to stop being pussies. That's what it is. Well, that's probably what he's going to say when I ask. Yeah. David Goggins. <laughs> oh, God. Just fucking winds me up. <laughs> but, but yeah, I just, I, I'm interested in getting your take, mate, again, because of, you know, everything you've achieved and given, you know, the, the kind of things that you've had against you. Like, what, what do you think, what do you think is causing that? Like, when you, when you see, like, young lads now and, and blokes, like, fucking just down in the dumps and, and suffering with depression, mm. some of it's legit. And I, I don't want to use the term loosely because, again, people, some people clinically do have real fucking issues. But there's a lot of people, I think, that throw the term around being depressed. Yeah. And it's just a bit of low mood. You say low mood. Sometimes I think it's, it's laziness. If that makes sense, they, they want to be lazy and it's a good excuse to be lazy. Mm. And that sounds crazy to say, but I've worked in retail for a long time and a lot of guys that I spoke to that wouldn't work, they would say they were depressed so that they could stay at home. Oh, I've had mates of that, yeah, oh, for Does sure. that make sense? Yeah, like, yeah. They would just do that. They would just, just go in and say, yeah. no, I'm depressed, I'm this and that. And really they got no drive. they got no gap and go. They're just, they're just lazy. You know? But, but th 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 if they're similar to the lads, I, some of the lads I grew up with, you know, they, they were fine and they just played the system. Yeah. But, it, but it seems these days, like everyone thinks they're depressed. Like right. these lads didn't, they knew they weren't fucking depressed. They were just playing the system. I think that's almost like a different thing, but some people really think that's the case. Um, so what, what, what are your thoughts, mate? Do you, do you think it is legit? Like if it is, what do you think is causing it? 
So it's, it's a difficult one, right? Mm. Because what's great is that there's so much more awareness around the stuff now. But what's not great is that there's so much more awareness around the <laughs> stuff now. So literally, like that you were just saying, like I, I'm very fortunate in that, as far as I'm aware, I've never suffered from depression. But what I my image of it is is someone who's unable to function, who's unable to get out of bed who it just sees no joy in anything and no point in doing anything in their life. Not someone that doesn't want to go to work for a day and just takes a day off and says they're depressed. You know, it's just, you're not depressed. You've just got, you're having a bad day. This is life. And because this is the thing, right? Everybody's struggling. Look at how expensive it is to live now. Look how many, like now just to survive, most people have to have two incomes into their household of a mum and a dad working full time, literally to keep their heads above water. God. It's ridiculous. At least 50 grand a year. And it, as it a is household ridiculous minimum. how much it costs to live nowadays, which is going to have an effect on people's mindset. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to go into depression, but they're going to feel like shit more than they ever used to in, in the history of, of the world. But, you know, with the younger generation, I love social media but it's a, it's a double-edged sword mm -hmm. and you get all these knobbers on there, right? Stood in front of Lamborghinis going, look how successful I am. I, I know a lot of these people and they're full of shit, right? They, they either don't own a car or, you know, the ones that are legitimately successful have worked their ass off and, and worked hard and most of them are pretty humble. But young lads and, and young girls look at that and they look at this woman who's been photoshopped with fillers in and filters on and all this and, they think they have to look like that to be happy. And lads think they need to be earning a hundred grand a year driving Lambos to be successful. It's bullshit, but it's in your face 24 seven with Instagram, TikTok and all this crap. And we, the world pedestalizes morons nowadays. Like you get some clown that goes on a reality TV show, right? Who's done nothing in their life, achieved nothing, but then they become a millionaire because they were on, I don't even know what reality TV shows there are, but they've been on something and then they get 2 million Instagram followers and all these young lads and young women look up to them like, oh, I want to be just like them. I'm like, no, you don't. Because, and I know some of these people too. And behind the scenes, actually, we're talking about depression. Some of these are actually legit depressed because it come, that kind of tag comes with a lot of pressure. Well, they're, probably, they're not used to it, are they? They no. go on this one they show get, and it changes their whole mm. life. And it's, it's, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of guys that used to go on. I can't even think which one it was. One one of the reality shows. I think it was like Essex or something like that. Mm. And a couple of them killed themselves. And from Lo Love Island, that was it. Right. A couple of them are from Love Island when they got back couldn't handle mm. it. And, um, now, why yeah, would you continue suicide. to air a show like that, right? Where Carol, people Carol were and contestants Flack, and the presenter have all taken their life. Why would you continue to put that in front of the nation? knowing it is so bad on people's mental health. You know, why wouldn't you put something more empowering and educational in front of them to give them a bit of a, you know, motivation to pick them up a little bit to, to change their perspective. But this is, you know, you go into schools now and you ask kids what they want to be when they grow up and they say famous. And like, what does that mean? Oh, I want 2 million TikTok followers. I'm like, do you really? <laughs> do you know what I mean? You don't, you want, if TikTok went away tomorrow, what would you do? And, and I've seen that before. I saw a young girl years ago who had her Instagram canceled, who made a YouTube video and she was crying, right? Pleading with Instagram to reinstate her account. And you kind of felt for a little bit until she started saying, I can't get a normal job, I'm above that. And I was like, see ya. <laughs> but this is what we, we encourage this kind yeah. of behavior with social media. It's like, yeah, just be, you know, be ex completely self-obsessed and narcissistic and film yourself everywhere you go. And then you'll be famous and, and then if you're not, instantly overnight, because everyone wants instant gratification, people get down about it. Why am I not? I've been doing it for 15 years and I'm nowhere near where I think I should be. The amount of effort I put into it and all I've been doing over the years to grow my social media. I'm doing it with a purpose. I don't want just people going, oh, wow, look at Mark. That's great. I'm, I'm doing it because I want to try and share my experiences and motivate and inspire people to have better mental health. You know, man, I just don't put. A, I was watching a video this morning. I'm going off on one now. I'll go off on one when it talks about this I shit. I fucking love it, so do I, mate. Go. But like my daughter, she was watching a fully grown woman walk around a, a like a sweet shop in America with a basket, picking out sweets, 
This woman was like 40. And she's running around with a camera going, hey guys, here I am again in the sweet store. And I'm like, you're 40. I don't, I don't why are you not like living yeah, a regular just, just life? Doing a thing, yeah. But I mean, I couldn't do it. I couldn't stick a camera on my face every day and f come up with something interesting to say. But the thing is, most of it isn't interesting. But kids, kids are the key. They watch it again and again and again. They tell their friends to watch it. And then everyone's liking, commenting, subscribing and making these people money. Do you know what I mean? And then it's just a, it's just a strange world where you don't, you know, back when we were kids and I don't necessarily agree with this model, but it was like, go to school, work hard, get good grades, get a good job, achieve things. Mm. But now it's like, yeah, just get yourself through and get a TikTok account. I think people attach their own value to social media. Yeah. Does that make sense? So if they, they've not got many followers and they want more followers, if they can never really get those followers, they sometimes they really do attach them their own personality to this mm. social account and right. social standing. You know, sometimes <clears throat> people think they're better than they are because they got fucking ten thousand followers. It's insane. And I think you're fucking mad, mate. You who gives a fuck if you got ten thousand followers because you post regularly, because you do these things. It's like just just be normal. Just just chill. If you've got ten thousand followers and you do like to post, that's cool. But don't make it or like that's not what you're worth you know what i mean mm -hmm. that's not your actual worth i think the struggle Doesn't is make you back. i think the struggle is though that there is money to be made in it now you oh ridiculous I mean? amounts of money and i think yeah so there, there's there is some legitimate value in it but i think there's a big difference though doing it for a job like, yeah a actively looking at it, it'd be like right we can exploit somebody here to earn yeah. some money or there's um attaching your own self-worth yeah well you know i think I mean? this is the difference and, and mark mentioned it a second ago and hopefully we're, we're trying to achieve this as well but it's it's when you do it with purpose Right. So when you do it with purpose and you're trying to help people and make a difference and then you get that recognition and maybe the financial reward is a, is a, is a sort of secondary result of that. I think it's when people get that success and they fucking know somewhere deep down that they've done fuck all. Mm. <laughs> like, yeah. And that's when it probably eats them yeah. up inside mm. to some extent. But I think as well, like you, you made a point a second ago um, and you mentioned perspective earlier mm -hmm. and I think we're a similar age. So I grew up in, in the city <clears throat> in quite a deprived area. I think at one point it was one of the most deprived areas in the country and everyone was fucking poor, mm -hmm. but there was no social media. Right. So ignorance was bliss. Right. So I was poor, but everybody was fucking poor. Yeah. I didn't know how the other half lived. Mm. So I was just in my little bubble, out stone fighting, mm -hmm. running around, playing tag, whatever we did. Whereas I think now, like you say, if people are seeing it online and especially if all these fucking people are on their fake and presenting this, this life that isn't even real, mm -hmm. you know, you get the, if, if I think back to where, where I grew up and how I grew up, if, if I could see all that shit now that kids see, mm. yeah, I think I might struggle a little bit. Mm. I just think really just, that time's not getting enough life experience. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we, we, we've both got boys the same age. Mm -hmm. We, they, they don't do what we used to do. No. Do you know what I mean? And, and I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing sometimes. I say it to, to Kirsty all the time. I say, sometimes I just want to say, go on, go out to play. You know what I mean? Yeah. Go out, just, but but, but you want to protect them because the, the the media, you know, don't go out, you know, pedophiles is this, is mm. that. And you, you're really protective where it's when I was younger, they, your mum, my mum just used to say, yeah. have your tea and yeah. fuck off. Yeah, go to you the know? And I used to be like, all right. And then, you know what I mean? But, yeah. you know, my, my boy makes me laugh. You'll come home and you go, dad, the street kids are down there today. I can't can't go down there. And we, street kids. That's what I call them. I go, it's the street kids down there. Jackie go, yeah, yeah. The bit, it was after me today, dad. Yeah, there was weird, there was weird, there was weird kids with a tan and <laughs> low body fat percentage. The ones that go out and exercise. That's what he's like. He's like, yeah, they tried to nick my board today, dad. He said, I just grabbed it and ran. Yeah. <laughs> I was just laughing, but... You know, you want to protect them, don't you? Because you want to, you want to kind of a better life mm. than what y you had. Yeah. You know, don't get me wrong. My my upbringing was great. You know, I had a good upbringing, but mm -hmm. you still want better for them. But sometimes I think we now protect them too much. They don't have enough life experience, and then maybe later on in life, I think you're seeing that with the twenty year olds now. They've probably had that. It, you know, only ten years ago, so they've been very sheltered mm. throughout all their teens. You know, like I couldn't believe it that eighteen to thirty holidays had cancelled about five six years ago. Did you know that? No, why? Because they don't. There's no fucking need for them anymore. Apparently, they, the the eighteen to thirty year old bracket of going out, you know, Malia, Magaluf, <coughs> all that shit, mm -hmm. it isn't a thing now, which I couldn't believe. Wow. Because they just don't do it. They don't. They don't binge drink like they used to, and then people look and go, "Oh, you know, that's a really good thing," you know. But it's fucking not. Because 
if you'd done any of them sort of holidays, te- te- when technically you, yeah. it is. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not for mental health, but, but not, for physical yeah. health. Though. No, but it's true, isn't it? You know, you, most people who experience those types of holidays when they're eighteen to twenty-five, they have a fucking great time. Mate, I tell you, you know, I tell you, I can't what, believe they're not a thing. I tell you, fucking why is because back when we were out fucking on the piss and, and do, getting up to all sorts, no fuck right camera phones. Yeah, well, do you reckon so that's what it is now? Probably, mate. Yeah, you're fucking like anything yeah, you do true. when you're hammered now, it's just going to mm. be all over the internet, yeah, isn't it? True. And then that's the yeah. other danger. You can't, you can't like be anonymous anymore. Like if you if you're out and you do anything, <laughs> like it's yeah. fucking you viral, aren't you? On yeah. TikTok, yeah, you stare at a good. girl like, for for fucking a second long too too long in the gym, and you're you're on TikTok these days. So it's it's yeah, mad. Yeah. yeah, I just thought that was mad though. Yeah, I think that culture's changed in the military as well. Yeah. So we used to be out four or five nights a week consistently yeah. like down Union Street that was when Union Street used to stretch from the top of Royal Parade down to Dance Academy yeah. and that was how we bonded as as a troop as a company as a unit now you go into I mean I haven't been on a camp for a while now but when I did lads have got 80 pound shirts their lockers are full of protein they've done a gym every night and rather than go out they just jump on Tinder swipe left a couple of times they're like lads we're back in an hour <laughs> get in their car and drive off come back and then they go to work the next day used to this is I kind of caught the tail end of this generation, but it was when people didn't really have cars. So in the military, you would stay on camp on the weekend. And I remember someone telling me a story back at at 4-2 Commando at at Bickley. They used to have a bus called the Bickley Bomber. And all the lads, this is like the late 80s, early 90s, they get on this bus and they go to the sundial in town. And you know where the toilets are? Mm -hmm. So there used to be a guy in there that would be like a, not a security guard, but because there's showers down there, right? So all the lads would go and give them, they go to like Debenhams, wherever, get their kit, give it to him, give him a couple quid. They go out drinking. It's up to them where they stayed for that night, but they'd never go back to, to Bickley because taxis were rare and they didn't have cars and you couldn't drink drive anyway. So they would, you know, go out and find a woman or wander the streets tonight. They'd meet back at the sundown the next day, go down, see the guy, have a shower, put their new clothes on they bought the day before, <laughs> go out again, meet again Sunday. And then they go back and they bonded. Now, 12 o'clock on a Friday, all the lads are in their cars, wheels are burning, they're up the motorway, driving nine hours to go home for a day. Hmm. So there's, the, it kind of feels it, a bit different it's def- now. Generation's definitely changing. Even like, even with football, speaking to one of my mates the other day and we're only 33 and obviously we played football from like a young age together and he was saying the the young 20 year old lads like they, they're not even coming on there like end of year piss ups and all that. And, and that there used to be mandatory you know what mm. I mean when you play for a football team it's that camaraderie it's that you do it together so we used to do like a Christmas do end of season football do everyone has to go no no exceptions it's like now no one, the young lads don't go Right. They just don't want to go on it. So you ended up with just the old fucking fogies, you know, all the boys in their 30s and that's it because the young boys just, they're not into it. They're but you, into wonder, it. you wonder a little bit, don't you? Like maybe this is a contributing factor to some men's mental health. They don't have those male relationships like that where they're out and it's just, you know, the testosterone fueled male environment where they're picking their noses and farting and, and yeah. talking about this and talking about that having a bit of a release at the end of a week. Because it's, I mean, it's different for women as well. But nowadays, the lines are very blurred between responsibilities as a, as a father and a mother. Like, it used to be quite clear cut, didn't it? Like, one would go, generally the dad would go and work all the time, come home, bring the money. The mum would maybe work part time, but look after the house and the kids. Now, and I can only speak from a, a man's point of view, you got to do the school runs. You got to have a job. You got to be at the football, the gymnastics. You got to do the bedtime, the wake up routine, and all of it. And it's all mixed and merged. And you know, there's only so many hours in a week. And the time that you used to have with the lads at the the Christmas football thing, or the the weekend out, or the rugby club thing, there's not much time for that anymore. And maybe I don't know. Maybe that I just thought about this now, but maybe that contributes to it because you need that kind of male camaraderie, don't you? To to make you feel good. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's it makes people. I think it makes you slightly stronger in life. You know, getting do, going out doing that type of stuff at mm. times. You know, there's loads of times when I got ripped to fucking shreds for some shit I've done, mm. and I think it makes you sometimes a stronger person. And I think it, if you're missing out that when you do come across any bad times in your life, you've got no tools to deal with it. Does that make sense? Mm. You got no tools to deal with it. You know, if you if you were in this protective bubble, and I talk about this with my wife all the time with with my son, I think he's got such a lovely life, yeah, and he has amazing life, right? But if later on in life something bad happens to him, you know, something really shit happens to him, yeah. 
has he got any tools at all to right. deal with it? You know, I had loads of stuff growing up, got beat up, got done this, done that, right. you know, all that right. type of stuff throughout my life. And then when something bad happens, and it still will happen, life's shit at times mm-hmm. and life's good at times. You know, it was always up and down. It never stays the same, especially as an adult. Mm-hmm. But what, how is he going to deal with that sort of stuff? And how is your son going to deal with your son? You know, because mm. we all want the best for them. But sometimes is giving them the best, mm. are they long term? We're just making them soft. <laughs> yeah. Are we just making them soft? And then they're not able to deal with problems. And then they go, ah, oh, you know what? Mm-hmm. I'm depressed. Yeah. I'm depressed. But not because they're actually depressed, but because they haven't got the tools to deal with Right. Them. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a pretty good point. I, I think I agree, mate. I had this conversation with my wife the other day, right? We've just started letting our son go out and hang around and, and with his mates on the weekends and go walking out of where we can see him, like around Plimstock and this and that. And the first day we did it, it started pissing it down with rain, right? And she's like, oh, let's, let's go. Because they got phones now, right? I'll just ring him and, and go pick him up. I'm like, no. So what's the worst that's going to... If he's smart, he'll find shelter, right? Like we did when we were kids. And what's the worst that's going to happen? He'll get wet get a cold, get a sniffle, be sick. So what? You'll yeah. learn from that. And that's this. That's not really adversity, right? But it's a little taste of it. Yeah. So I'm like, no, we'll just leave him. Let you figure it out for himself. Worst case, he's going to go home tonight. He's going to have a warm shower, a warm bed, a warm meal and a roof over his head. Like you couldn't ask for any more than that, no, you, you know? So you got to let, I'm, we're kind of trying to drip feed him yeah. little bits because he goes to big school in September. And that's going to make or break him, I think. Yeah, one of my mates, he's uh, he's got a stepson who um, I think is, I don't know, maybe 14 now. And I was laughing the other day, I was chatting to him because he said that literally for about six months before his kid went to big school, he, uh, he'd he been his like stepdad for years. So it's his, you know, essentially his son. Um, but he said he, he put him just through the mill with banter and teasing, mm-hmm. just butchered him for about six months yep. because he's, you know, he's, he's quite witty, my mate. And he was like, if this kid goes to school and he can't handle a bit of banter, mm-hmm. it's just going to ruin him. Yeah, yeah. Jack's, Jack's had that for 10, 11 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's yeah, fucking mate. ready. <laughs> I do it too. Yeah. And I'm not precious about swearing around my kids yeah. or anything like that. Like, and if they if they piss me off, I will shout at them because they need to know. They need to know where the line is and that you can't just go around being rude and disrespectful to people and expect them to go, you know, I, I remember sitting in I'm a, a stickler for manners. I don't know about you. Yeah. If my boy, if he, if he met either of you and he didn't, you know, yeah. didn't use his manners, that, that straight away I'm on it. You know, I'm like, yeah. please, thank you. You know, and if he didn't mm. do it, I'd tell him. Yeah, I was, I was in a service station once, right? Sat down having lunch and uh, this bloke's there with his son and the wife gets up and, and walks off and the son, probably about, I don't know, five, maybe six, Maybe, maybe a bit younger than that. Got this chair, pushed it across the floor and it's going. <whistles> so the dad's like, I can't remember his name, just say Jack. Don't do that, Jack. The kid looks at him, <whistles> pushes the chair. He's like, come on, Jack. Let's have a chat about this. And I'm watching it. And this, <laughs> this bloke was negotiating with his child. And I'm like, you need to pick that kid up, right? Slap it. Well, you, don't have to slap it. <laughs> you need to discipline your kid in front of all these people, right? To show them that you're not scared to. I remember when one of my kids had a meltdown in, I think it was Morrison's or something. So I had a meltdown as well. I'm like, I don't give a shit. People look at me, they look at me anyway. So you're going to cry, I'm going to cry. Like negotiating with like a four or five year old. I'm like, you don't negotiate. Yeah, I have this battle with mother half all the time with our kid because she's, you know, a typical mother, like just lets him get away with murder. But even stuff, like I, I raised my voice to him and she, we had a bit of a ding dong about this back in the day because she was like, you just can't scream and shout at people. I said, first, I'm not screaming and shouting. I'm just mm. raising my voice. Mm. Secondly, he doesn't understand English. He's two. Right. So you can't have a discussion with him. Right. You've got to give him the tone. Yeah, the tone. Uh, yeah. And yeah. he's got to understand. And I said, he can go for his whole life. Everyone ever shout at him. The moment he gets to school, and someone shouts at him, to your point, it will just have a meltdown. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, I think you need, you need to, but also just, I think, standing your ground with kids as well. Mm. Whereas, you know, he will, I don't know, throw his toys on the floor. And I'm like, pick him up. And he'll be like, no. And I'm mm-hmm. like, pick him up. Mm. We'll stay as long as you need to, mate. We're not leaving until you pick him up. Mummy can do it. No, mummy's not doing it. You pick him up. And we'll have a standoff for half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a, you know, that's a long time. Now. He's only three. To me, it's not. It's a drop in the ocean. And yeah. I'll stand there until it's done. And eventually now, he's he listens. Mm. But still, 
with me, he'll be good as gold. Mum walks in, starts being a whiny little brat. Okay, right. So you can still see the difference between letting him get away with it and not letting him go with it. Yeah. So yeah, I think it really makes yeah. it team. It's a difficult road to navigate, yeah. you know, being being a father. There's no mother. there's no right or wrong, really, though, is there? With no. stuff like, you know, you, you look at it and you think, oh, I'm doing it the right way. I think only time tells with that when they, mm. when they grow up and they become adults and, yeah. you know, they, they do their own thing. And that's thing. the thing, you know, I look at all my kids and I know I'm biased, but they're all pretty great and they're all pretty balanced and they know how to toe the line and they know when they've crossed the line. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. One's nine, one's 11, one's 18. They they know now and, and I'm very proud of them and, and how they have and are developing. So, you know, every once in a while when you, you have those doubts, don't you? Am I doing the right thing? And every once in a while, I just kind of step back and look at them and go, I think we're doing all right. Do you know what I mean? They're pretty well-rounded. So, yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, and I think that's, to your point, that's kind of what you're seeing like a little bit now, isn't it? Where you've got these adults, sort of, you know, 18, 20, and maybe they haven't had that, you know, and they've got their participation medals throughout life and, and now they're really struggling because oh, life is you, struggling I, I don't know if I told you this, my boy went to a um, football tournament on Friday and he plays for MAP, which is quite a good school team. Yeah. They're always yeah. quite good. They went to um, this tournament up at Exeter. He won the tournament. I was like, oh, where's your, where's your medal? No, I didn't get one. I was like, what? Yeah, he got everyone got a participation medal. Oh. I was like, well, <laughs> yeah. I just couldn't believe it. I was like, what? So you didn't get anything for winning it? He was like, no. And I was just, just like, that's fucking shit. And he, and he, I was just look at him before. He was so excited because they'd won. You know, he'd, yeah. you know, they'd worked hard. They won every game. And then they don't even get anything to show for it. And I understand, like, for the kids that don't win, but there's, there's in fucking life, there's winners and losers. Like, if if me and you row and you, you beat me a fucking million times, mm -hmm. that, that's no, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, no, but do you know what I mean? It, it's, it's one of those things. And for me to get better, I've got to lose and accept that and then keep mm -hmm. pushing through, you know, mm -hmm. to try and get better. Yeah. If everyone goes hard, it's all right. Every time you lose, it's, it's fucking. I think, I think the, 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 the struggle is, is that it's not going away is it social media and no. and that type of thing so I think unless everybody starts doing jujitsu the world's fucked <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like well well we just everyone starts fucking going against it a bit yeah I don't know, you know I don't know how it's going to happen it's mainstream media really isn't it yeah a lot of it's driven by no, all you know? of it's just hard I, I, I don't watch the news any, I've, I've stopped watching it years so ago what you say? I, don't, I don't watch any news no that's a that's a problem with people with mental health as well like news I, I I remember I can't remember who I was talking to about this but I, I started like breaking down what I think the average person's day looks like and to me it kind of like the alarm goes off in the morning and they'll hit the snooze button at least three times right <laughs> and then they'll drag their ass out of bed miserable knowing that they're going to go to a job that they hate they probably won't train they'll probably have a less than nutritious breakfast and while they're doing all that, they, the first thing they've done is put the telly on. They've got the news on in the background, right? And whether they're consciously or subconsciously listening to the telly, they're taking it on, right? So the economy's tanked, the cost of living's going up, there's a war in this country, this guy's done this. It's just bad shit, right? Going into their brain constantly. So then they're getting ready. Maybe if they got kids, the, the, they've got no routine and it's stressful and you're shouting and screaming. This is all before eight o'clock in the morning, right? So then they get in their car, they flick the radio on, they got the same negative news on repeat all day going into their head. They get cut up on the way to work. Then they get stuck in a traffic jam. They turn up at a job they don't like. They get to the coffee machine. They meet with four other people that have had exactly the same start to the day. And before our past eight in the morning, on a Monday, everyone's just angry and down. And it's like... And on top of that, they're probably not getting paid enough for the work they do. No. Yeah. And this is what we said earlier. There's there's a, a husband and a wife both doing that for 40 plus hours a week just to keep their heads above water. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's insane. And you can understand why people do get depressed when they are living that sort of lifestyle. Yeah. But I think our message to them would be to really... I, I think sometimes you've got to like evaluate your life, where you're at and where you want to be. So not sometimes, you, all the time. Yeah, well, yeah, all yeah, the, all the regularly. time. Yeah, and and really look at where you want to go in life and yep. what you want to achieve. And it may not be everyone. Everyone isn't trying to aim for the stars. Does that make sense? Yeah. Some people are happy. Some people want yeah an average where income at, yeah. where they can have a holiday. But yeah. if they're in that position where they're struggling to pay the bills, then I would say to all men, especially, you know, as as a man, it's not a bad thing to be a man. Be a, you know, provider for your family. Mm -hmm. Look at it and think, right, I'm in this job now. 
you know, we've had Dan Casey on and a few other people talking about, you know, being productive in the workplace. But can they put a plan in place to earn an extra thousand pound a month? Mm -hmm. Because that thousand pound a month might make all their problems go away financially. And it's not even a lot of money. If you really break it down, 250 pound a week is not a lot of money. No. Nope. Especially not in this day and age, fucking hell, four pound a box of cereal. Mm. So they can then look at it and go, right, I'm here, we're struggling. Every month, there's nothing in the bank. It's causing friction here, here, and here. We're getting letters through the door, it's causing stress, blah, 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 blah. Tr focus on earning that extra thousand, whether it's getting a new job, getting a promotion, you know, doing an extra course in your spare time. And they, if they go, oh, I'm too tired, there's no way that people, I've done, I've done a course in my spare time. You can do three five hours a week and you can get a qualification and just apply yourself to something to go into the right direction you know and i don't think enough people do that yeah no you're exactly right and you mentioned it earlier with like ricky like and how he's a positive like person to be around because he's always doing the same stuff like self-developing and i think like even a barrier of course would be like people can't afford courses but you don't even need to go on courses you just need to acquire new skills and new information and you can do that for free on youtube yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like in the, and you can level up from that, and you can do it on YouTube while you're on the treadmill in the morning, getting ready for work. Yeah. Before you, you know, you're exercising, you're educating yourself, you go into your workplace, you're becoming more valuable to your boss. You make them aware you're more valuable. You get paid for the value that you add to the workplace. So then you be like, boss, can, any chance we can have a chat about a pay rise? Yeah. Or you go out and figure out one of the millions of side hustles. You know, my daughter, right? I couldn't be prouder. She's 18 years old. She's been training as a beauty therapist or I, I might have got the term wrong she's in the, the the makeup artist world since she was 13 years old she built up all her qualifications before she left school left school went self-employed at the minute what she does is considered a luxury so it's a little bit lean in terms of people aren't spending money like they used to she delivers Chinese in the afternoon in the evenings like yeah, that's fair play isn't it? Yeah, she's out there grinding at night with her boyfriend driving around delivering Chinese to people to make ends meet she's not coming to me going dad can I have a hundred pound dad can you pay for this dad she doesn't do that which is what I I'll be honest I expected for a couple years but she's like no I'm going to figure this out I've, I know there's a way to make a bit of money not only can I make a bit of money and this this might sound a bit weird but she's spending time with her boyfriend she's having fun and, and delivering Chinese and making a bit of money. So, you know, yeah, more hats all off about to that. Yeah, yeah, fair play. Like, there, if more people were like that, though, this whole world would be a better place. You know, if people put in that extra 10% at times mm. and didn't blame other people, that's what I find as well. People do a blame game. Right. You know what I mean? They, they look at it, they look at their situation, they go, oh, he's got this, he's got that. Why have I not got it? And a lot of the time, they don't ever look at themselves and go, oh, it's because. I'm not willing to do that mm. hour of work, you know, hour workout to make mm -hmm. myself feel better, to work an extra half an hour that I'm unpaid for regularly to then get a promotion or to then get an extra bit of money, mm. you know? And you've obviously been a manager for however long. You've probably seen so many people do bare minimum, mm -hmm. bare minimum. And then you've got people that do the most <laughs> and who always goes ahead, who always earns more money and it all, who always does better. Mm. That person who just does that little bit more. Yeah, but I think it's, um, <clears throat> so that instant gratification thing we've mentioned earlier where I think people expect to be rewarded for doing the basics. Mm. You know what I mean? Where people just turn up, they do their job and they expect like a, 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 a kind of promotion or you know, uh, some sort of recognition for just doing the basics. And yeah, well, that's just, just being in the role. Yeah. yeah, well that's just your job. You get a paycheck for that. Yeah. Like well done, but go above and beyond that, go the extra mile. And that's the thing where you, you yeah. get, you get further on. So yeah, so people just needed a little bit more do Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> so uh, speaking of, of developing and goals and everything, mate, um, I imagine you've probably got lots coming up, lots of you're doing. Uh, obviously you've achieved like so much over the years. I think that Invictus Games, two years running, <clears throat> 2017, yeah. 2018, uh -huh. medaled in both, I think four golds in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, obviously got your MBE. Mm -hmm. um, and just continue to do amazing work with like reorg. I think you did your your run. I think we mentioned it earlier. You did your swim as well. Yeah, it was a world record. Yeah, was it? What yeah. was that? The fastest one kilometer in the open water using just one arm. <laughs> so thirty three minutes. That's fucking good going, yeah. mate. I don't think I could do that. It's all that lean muscle, mate. You just oh, yeah. mate. <laughs> just fucking just yeah, yeah, you know. But this is exactly what arms, we're, this is exactly <laughs> what we're just talking you. about. Right, so all these little things. So there's so many parts to this. To do all that stuff, right, I have to be around good people. I have to set myself goals. 
by achieving them, I've added value to who I am as a person. Do you know what I mean? And it all just goes hand in hand in hand. And it, it isn't easy. You do have to make a commitment to it. And the, the you know the biggest stumbling block where I think a lot of people fall is the action part. They, they'll plan it, they'll schedule it, they'll talk about it. But when it comes to pulling the trigger, that something stops them and, and holds them back, whether that's life, time, commitments to family or whatever it is. But, you know, you've just got, to hustle and you've just got to put the extra the extra effort and, and extra work in i'm not going to say the old cliche we've all got the same 24 hours in a day but there's ways to make your time more efficient like i just said i said it kind of jokingly but you know get on the treadmill in the morning before work do 20 minutes on the treadmill while listening to an audiobook or a podcast you're learning you're burning and you, you're feeling better before you even get out the door yeah. and there's loads of ways yeah 100 do, do you know what i think I did this, uh, this this exercise a while back when I was studying alongside a full time job, um, where I basically sat down, got up. I think I used like I don't know, um, like Apple Calendar or something, mm -hmm. and basically just literally on a week just mapped out all my time that I was doing stuff because yeah. I felt busy as fuck and I was like I haven't got any time for anything, so I literally laid it all out on a calendar, color coded everything. I'm a bit geeky like that, um, but when I did that, I realised that I had so much time. I was like, well, if I just don't watch TV and you know, did this, like you say, multitask where you can. Then each day I've got four hours, Monday to Friday, four hours. And that, that that's, you know, that's already having family time in there as well. Four hours every day is fucking loads of time across mm -hmm. five days. Mm -hmm. And then most of the weekend as well. And suddenly I was like, yeah, this is definitely achievable. Yeah. I felt like I didn't have a lot of time, but now I see it. I can fit loads in. There's loads more I can do. But this is the thing, right? People aren't taught that. Mm. You you did that off your own back, right? I've done that similar stuff, time ordering, mm. Right. People, we're not taught that. Budgeting, financial management, time management. We, we, you either figure it out or you just don't. And a lot of people just don't. Yeah. And, you know, that this is why I think a lot of these these problems arise. Th those are valuable life skills that I think a lot of young people should, it should be mandatory to learn things like this so that they understand that. And, uh, and, and there are people out there that teach this, you know, personal development guys and girls and there's courses you know, but it's it's overwhelming. It's just a, a minefield, excuse the pun, of, of information out there. And sometimes, like in the fitness world, you know, it's so overwhelming and contradictory. And one person says this, one person says that. And sometimes you're just pulling your hair out like, what's the, what am I supposed to do? But if we were taught these things at a younger age, I think we'd all have a lot less stress. You'd definitely lives. be able to wade through the bullshit yeah. if yeah. you were taught nutrition, say, at school. You know, in, in a bit, and not even in depth, but just enough to know you know, when then you get me on saying that you've got to do this and it's mm, fucking yeah. utter shit. You'd, you'd know yeah. straight away. But yeah, I agree with the finance stuff as well. And what did you call it? Time auditing. Yeah, yeah audit yeah. your time, yes. audit your bank account, audit I've, everything. I've, yeah, like I've done it. I've never used that term. It's, it's a good term. Yeah. Um, but yeah, all that sort of stuff I think would definitely help. Um, so what's next then, mate? So we kind of, I was framing there the question of, okay. I'm sure you've got loads of shit going on. But what's, yeah. what's next for you? Like fitness and business goals, anything else you've got coming up? Hopefully securing some very close to getting some book deals together okay. yeah. at the minute. I've got a bunch of talks booked around the country. I am competing in jiu-jitsu, I think, at least once a month, aiming for the Abu Dhabi Power World Championships in November. Okay. Uh, I don't have any kind of fundraising challenges in the calendar mm. this year yet, but I have a sadistic group of friends that um, <laughs> often have very what they think are very bright ideas and end up coercing me into doing these things. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm more focused now than I ever have been before on, on things like business goals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were talking before, me, me and Ricky just spent a bunch of money buying microphones and, and equipment to start our own podcast. I've got the book stuff going on. I've got a couple of bits and pieces going here and there. Because I had this kind of, I, I always have, like brainwaves in the shower about and these little epiphanies. And I, I can't remember what it was either I was dealing with in my life at this point or someone was talking about, but it made me switch my focus from uh, not so much in a personal development kind of place, but to a, a business and, and money orientated kind of place, not through greed, but what I wanted to do was build some businesses have what I will call huge success in those businesses 
to show people that I've got four fingers, one thumb on a smartphone, right? And I've got the same, I'm not trained. I've got 10 GCSEs, that's it. I've got the same access to the information as anyone else has with YouTube and social media. If I can figure this out, right? And have huge success with it, then anybody can. Because I've got four fingers, a thumb and that's it. So if I can do that, if I can be super successful in the business world, then anyone can do it really. Do you know what I mean? So that's where I'm focusing now. And the last 14 plus years have been nothing to do with that. But I kind of feel like I've scratched all those itches in fundraising, physical challenges and that kind of stuff. So I've slightly changed my direction, but it's going all right so far. We're doing all right so far. Um, we'll see. Mm. Yeah, yeah, awesome, man. Exciting, man. Mm. Cool. Anything you want to kind of finish up with in regard to uh, advice, information, plugs for the listeners? I just think, you know, with this this whole podcast, is what I like to do when I listen to podcasts is, is cherry pick bits out. And, you know, if we're talking about mental health, the, the best advice I can give, and I'll probably miss bits, I should have brought some notes with me. But if you want to start and put it in some sort of logical order, the first thing I would suggest is that people take a look at their, their physical health and their nutrition. Then the people that they hang around with then look at the things that are important to them in their life, start setting some goals in those areas, then start working towards those goals. And you go on this journey, right? And it's got highs and it's got lows. And this is going to sound so corny because everyone says this, but it's not about the, the destination, it's about the journey. And just enjoy this ride and ride these highs, understand the lows are a necessary part of it. So don't get too bogged down with that. And just, just keep moving forward and making progress in your life. Because like I said earlier, I think human beings are at their happiest when they're moving forward and making progress with their life. So if you're suffering with, with issues and in, in your mental health and you're down, those are the things that I would focus on in, in the first instance. And they're, they're going to help you take that first step towards taking back control of it and having more positive mental health. Brilliant. It's amazing, mate. Thanks, mate. Cool. Yeah, Thanks for coming on, buddy. Appreciate it. No worries. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you. Cheers, man.